Good noontide, Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green. Welcome to all of you on a balmy Honolulu day, temperature 82 degrees, trade winds at 10 to 12 miles an hour. Who could get any more beautiful than that? And we're going to talk today about resource efficiency. Resource, I thought this was an energy efficiency program. No. Resource and energy efficiency go hand in hand because we're going to be talking about low income or houseless or housing for houseless people via shipping containers. And think about it, shipping containers are already built. You don't need to pour new steel, new concrete, new anything into them. You just modify the existing containers. So you don't have to chop down trees. You don't have to go to the steel, steel mill and build new steel structures. It's all embodied energy there, not to mention just a wee bit of uh, cost saving in the process, which is why we can offer homeless and low income housing. And to talk about that today is Purnima McCutcheon, whose name you doubtless recognize because she is the former president of AIA Honolulu. So welcome, Pranima. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Mm -hmm. Pranima is going to talk about two projects, one an award-winning project in Los Angeles and another innovative project on a small site in New York City. So by all means, Take it away, Pranima. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. And uh, yeah, I am Pranima McCutcheon. I'm a local architect. Um, I was raised in India, but I've lived on the islands since the 1990s. Uh, I did spend about eight years overseas uh, during that period in India and in Mongolia. And I feel like I might have a little bit of a global perspective to this very, uh, you know, this crisis that's looming uh, all around us here and globally. Um, so I, thanks so much, Howard. And uh, I wanted to take this uh, opportunity really to share two projects that I've worked on. These are not projects that I worked on um, at work. Uh, these are projects, they actually design competitions that I did along with a friend, um, Robert McDonald, uh, RIBA. He's, um, he's a well-established residential architect uh, in the UK. And with Louis Dorantran, who helped us with our uh, renderings and modeling, uh, all, of, uh, you know, all of it for, uh, for the submissions, for the competitions. So the one on the right was one that we did in 2019, and it was um, in New York and um, on a very small site providing low cost housing and the one at the bottom which i'm going to start by sharing first um, is uh, for skid row in los angeles if you uh, if you can move to the next slide please uh, so this the skid row um, 2020 international design competition was sponsored by aia committee on design as well as uh, los angeles county and uh, we were actually honored to be uh, awarded third place for our, our submission here. Um, so for, for those that are not familiar, Skid Row is basically a 54 block area in downtown Los Angeles that has become synonymous with homelessness and poverty. And on any given night, like several thousand people sleep on the streets out here. Um, and so for this one, the design brief was to provide transitional housing as well as social services uh, for the homeless community of Skid Row. And it was, we were provided this very narrow, small, uh, not very convenient lot, perhaps. Uh, and the idea was to provide a temporary structure for a lifespan of three to 10 years, which can be disassembled. It was to be done sustainably, cost efficiently, it was meant to be done fast because you know there's a crisis, and um, this was also kind of uh, during COVID. Actually, this competition was 2020, and and so the the need was very urgent. So it was also supposed to be something that was replicable. Um, 
And I, I think I mentioned that we were not actually given a program. Oh, I, I don't think I mentioned it, but we weren't given a program as to how many units to fit and how dense it should be, or even what social services were required. We were tasked with figuring all of that out. Um, so th this is our solution. This is the street side. We had, uh, we use uh, containers and I'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, maybe we go into the next slide. Um, so on the lower part of the screen is what we call a site plan. And on the right hand side, so that what's, uh, you know, the boundary, um, the gray boundary around are the adjacent properties and our properties in the, in, in the center. To the right is the street or the entry into the site. Um, now this, this, and you can see the image on the top, which is sort of a, a view looking at the facility from the street. Now on, on the bottom side or, or on that image on the left-hand side is an existing hotel. It's called the Panama Hotel. It's a residential hotel. Um, and then on the right is a, a lighthouse. Uh, I mean, sorry, a chapel. Uh, it's called the Azusa, Azusa Lighthouse Chapel. And, and to the rear of the site is a warehouse. Uh, but but um, this is what we would call a zero lot line uh, development because um, the properties adjacent to these are, everybody's allowed to build, build right to the lot line and it is zoned so that you can go up to six stories high. So we could be pretty much locked within the site with no, no light, uh, you know, and ventilation. So our design, we basically ended up doing something that was inward looking and we created courtyards and we avoided long corridors. We ended up having a very simple circulation between uh, these, you know, the residences and the services. So everything uh, like we allowed for natural ventilation to happen easily that way and provided people a nice pleasant area to look at rather than looking at just walls around, um, you know, around them. So, um, so as I was saying, or, um, I was gonna uh, talk a little bit more about um, why we chose containers. So we reviewed a variety of options. Uh, we reviewed, um, you know, going with traditional um, construction. We also looked at um, purpose-built uh, containers that, you know, they, they build it exactly to what your specifications are. But then we finally settled on repurposed containers because, partly because there are 11 million unused containers in the world. And uh, it just seems more environmentally sensitive to try to reuse that. It also creates more employment. If you can reuse it, you know, um, you're kind of uh, trying to take care of multiple problems at the same time. But it also would be initial lower, uh, initial cost would be lower. Labor cost would be a little bit higher than uh, purpose built, but, but it's good for us uh, to have labor. Um, and then it's durable, it's strong. Um, and um, so why not? So that's kind of how we came up with the idea to use containers. Mm -hmm. And um, moving on to the next slide. So um, this, this uh, plan basically um, shows a typical plan um, and I'm, I'm going to have a better plan for you later, but this plan basically is from levels two to six, and it actually makes it easier for me to explain the upper floor plans because they're re repetitive and then move to the lower floor plan. Uh, but so um, in this diagram, I've got a bunch of units on the right hand side, which is repeatable pod A, the blue pod, and then we have the pink pod. Now the blue pod uh, has um, the units that face the, the street. They're like shotgun units, you know, parallel to the street with balconies overlooking the street. And then it has, um, it has like a central, actually both of them have a central core where you have the stairs and the gray areas is your elevator block. And all of the white areas are basically uh, open to the elements on at least on one side. So, um, uh, okay, so we decided to do ha have two pods and smaller, you know, corridors rather than a long corridor that went from one end of the site to the other, but also because these pods can be then replicated on a variety of different um, sites, you know, you might have an L shaped site, you might have a narrower site, you, you can just, you might have a broader, you know, wider site. So these become with some tweaking, they can be reused in, in different places. So that's, that's like one of the key takeaways is like, if we can 
replicate something, then we can really bring the cost down. So anyway, so that with that, I can move on to the next one. Yeah. And Pr Pranima, let me point out that uh, LA has a relatively mild climate. So you're taking advantage of that mildness by opening up absolutely as much as you can. And that certainly reduces energy consumption also and gives people access to fresh air and fresh views. Exactly, and applicable to Hawaii too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this one again is a, a more detailed plan showing the um, all of the um, the level the residential levels, which is levels from two to six, and um, so again the the gray areas are all of our units, and um, the green areas are the courtyards, the white areas are uh, stairs and corridors. There's little uh, orange or in this screen, it's showing up as little pink rectangles here and there. Those are little benches where people can kind of sit and engage with whoever's passing by. Uh, we also have, um, it's hard to see on this drawing, but we have common laundry facilities on each floor. So it allows for uh, social interactions, uh, you know, amongst the residents to kind of help create a community. Uh, so that was one of our thinking. And then all of the orange arrows are basically arrows through windows, doors. Uh, it's basically showing how views, uh, you know, how how we can create some sort of a, a natural surveillance. So uh, the residents are always looking onto some sort of a common area from their units. And so that, you know, we don't have these, it's to create some sort of a natural security, uh, you know, pe people will never be in some sort of a dark corner or, you know, where they might feel threatened. There's always some natural oversight by the residents. Uh, in fact, the courtyard at the, to the left of the screen, um, that's actually a, a kid's play area. It's kind of secured, but, you know, you always have people looking on or the ability look, to look on from upper floors so you know that, that if, if there's any any situation you can always call security right away and take care of it so security and you know a place where people really feel safe and joyful and happy was really important to us um i guess we could move on to the next slide all right so maybe we can zoom in a little bit on this one so we provided basically four unit types and each um, uh, each unit type has its own bathroom. We thought it was important for them to have the privacy of their own bathroom. So even though this, this one unit is just a single container, it's unit type A. Um, and um, actually before I go on to it's the specific unit type, I also wanna mention that all the units are acoustically and thermally insulated. They're not provided with air conditioning. They provide, the intention is to really create spaces that are uh, well uh, ventilated naturally and with ceiling fans um, and lit also with natural daylight. So in, in this particular unit, uh, this is type A, it's for, we think it would be more for like uh, folks that are chronically homeless. So we haven't provided kitchen services in this. We have common kitchen area at, at, on the lower floor, which I'll show you later. Uh, but it does have a bathroom. It has some storage areas, a bed, little like, you know, little places to sit out and then a, a balcony. And and the the drawing on the right shows all of the units kind of lined up on each floor, like you can have six units and the balconies are like a little bit more funky. You can, you know, add, um, you know, a variety of play of uh, in and out, zigzag up and down. So you can create some fun without uh, and an interesting design without really spending a lot of money on it. Uh, we don't see that as an expensive element. Uh, and then the drawing in the middle, which we can't see too well, but basically it it's a sketch showing how a small space can be really organized well to you know, provide you with the um, high functionality. So, you know, storage built in and uh, space like that brown area, you know, where we have a lower um, sort of ceiling where you can, you know, put some bags and things. So just efficient planning can go a long way in making a small container be much more, uh, you know, usable. Um, I think uh, we could, Let's see if there's anything else. 
Yeah, I think that was it for this one. And so we can move to the next slide. So like, so we basically had four unit types and that was unit type A. And then here in the blues is the ADA units, which we have on level one of, of one of the pods. And then the others are unit type B and C. And just very briefly, uh, the idea is that they kind of like Lego pieces kind of go together. So the, the ADA, for example, there's a unit on the left and the right, but the bathrooms are central. And so they can be stacked and it's, it, it's less expensive when you do something like that. Um, there's a lot more turning around space and, you know, make very comf more, much more comfortable for somebody who might be in a wheelchair or have other uh, accessibility issues in the ADA unit. Uh, but it can accommodate up to two adults and a, a, a young child on a pullout bed. So, I mean, this, you know, uh, that's your unit type ADA. And then the one in the pink is quite similar, but with more, more, uh, you, it doesn't have to be as tight. So, um, you know, we have more dining area and, and things like more closet like that. Um, but very similar, and they could be converted either or depending on if you need more, more uh, ADA units, you could convert the pink ones into more ADA units. And then the bottom one, the purple one is actually for a larger group, like a, a, maybe a family or you know, maybe four or five people living together. It has like a master bedroom with a small study area, bathroom. All of these units, like these three, unlike the type A have kitchenettes, so you can cook as well if you want to. Uh, and it has a children's bedroom as well, uh, the one, the purple one. So you can sleep up to two, you know, two, plus adults and then, you know, two teenagers, a young child. So, I mean, it, it allows for more. Uh, so we have these different varieties of unit types. So it allows for, you know, many, many um, groups of users to be able to use this facility. I think, oh, I and I think I pointed out that earlier, you know, the areas between the two units have the ability to either have like, you know, um, a washer dryer or a bench or so, so we are using anyways, every little bit of space that we can to provide, you know, to think of as many things as we think they need uh, amenities and facilities. So I think with that, I can go on to the next slide. I hope. Howard, this is fine. If, if there you, is any you, questions. You've got about eight minutes, Pranima. Oh, okay. I didn't realize. <laughs> okay, so we will move faster then. So we used about 126 containers. 111 were used for housing about 158 adults, 59 children. 15 were used for supportive services. And we'll move on to the next slide. Um, this shows the zoning. And I just want to quickly point out, so this is level one on the right-hand side of the street. It's the most complicated level because we have residents up on the upper floors, but they need to be entering safely and securely. But we also wanted to provide services for others that aren't so fortunate to be able to sleep in inside, uh, you know, uh, that are still on the streets. So the bottom orange is where we have uh, bathroom uh, toilet facilities and drinking water facilities and that would be available to anybody off the street 24 7. Then the little light blue area above it is uh, a security information reception for the sort of secure areas but also a place where you can find out where you could go for certain services. Then that big peach uh, or light pink band above. Uh, it has a kitchenette where up in the entry, like a dining area where you can pick up your trays and pick up food and then go into the, you know, into these common areas where you, you, anybody off the street anytime is able to come in at, give, at scheduled times for a meal, like breakfast, lunch, dinner. And then in the middle, the dark pink area is where you have counseling offices, job training and, and the like. And then uh, and supportive services offices, and then the yellow area is also a place where people could get like their, you know, some podiatry, uh, some hair care, and showers, and that would be like within certain like you know twelve hours of the day scheduled so that you, they can accommodate a lot of people. And then the purple and blue areas are the secure residence areas, and they have different ways to get in there. So you, depending on your comfort level, if you want to go through with the purple one, you can go through there, or you can go from the outside. And I think that was it in a nut nutshell. I mean, it's very complex and we just want to make sure everybody's safe, but we want to provide maximum services. And Pranima, you do have, uh, I guess, 24-7 security? Yes. Areas? Yeah. Yes. 
yeah so it it would be required i think at you know at least at the early stages um okay and then we can go on to the next one which i just uh the next slide okay i just want to point out that you know we use very simple methods of uh getting an interest in the design, a little bit of perforated screen at the bottom for like light and shadow, you know, varied balconies, some pop of color and, you know, inexpensive method, but we still believe in the power of design to heal. We believe in like, you know, making a building really lovely for the users. With that, I can go to the next one. <laughs> So this one actually, um, so this this one mm, is in New York City, uh, and this was actually a really good pro uh, project. Basically, what the city of New York did is they identified 23 sites, uh, and they're all very narrow and inconvenient lots. And they want they gave us one site to design to, but they want that design to be flexible so that it can be applied to 23 sites and perhaps more later. So on the top right, you see a little image with you know, two buildings with a narrow sliver in the middle. Well, that's 17 feet wide and about 100 feet deep. And that's your site. I don't know if you can picture 17 feet. I mean, out of that, you lose you know, two feet just for the walls. 15 feet, it's, it's, it's like maybe somebody's you know, dining area or, or living area in the house or something very narrow. Uh, but we managed to put eight units on this lot. Uh, and uh, we were, we had some height restrictions and all, but we have an entry level lobby, an ADA, ADA studio on the lower floor, and we have a bunch of studios upstairs. But we have a little roof deck amenity with some you know gardening opportunities for the community. Um, anyhow, so I'm I'm gonna go on to the next slide and um, explain it a little bit more. Uh, so this is what it looks like when you cut a section through the building. So you can see the lobby at the bottom. One of the strategies we used was like to go split split level so we can keep the core that's in yellow right now very small and give more space to the units on the small side. So it's a, it's a strategy we used. And then we also wanted to get a lot of light in so we have translucency to that uh, elevator core. So, you know, so the light from the balconies on the outside uh, we have uh, we have means to bring it all the way inside, and you'll see that on the next slide. But we have photovoltaics on the roof out there. I should point out. But anyways, and so in this, this is a, a detailed plan on the lower part of the drawing, and upper part of the drawing is a section through one of the units. And you can see that the light is coming in through the balcony side and bouncing all the way in because we didn't go, I mean, these are studios. We decided not to go uh, with walls all the way up to the ceiling. And we also have little, you know, glazed areas between the, the you know, in the walls so that the light bounces all the way back to the corridor and then, or the core, and then you, you have light coming in from there. So very a simple strategy to have natural daylight throughout. Um, Okay, so I think with that, I'll just move on well, to the. Well, let me let me point out, uh, Pranima, the benefits of daylighting. These are low income people. Yeah. And right, this is for low income. I should have yeah, specified yeah. this project is for low income group. And they might have been living in very cramped quarters before with very little daylight. You're bringing daylight in, and you are automatically improving their quality of life simply just with this daylight all over. And uh, from an energy efficiency standpoint, you can't uh, light a space much more efficiently than, than with daylight. Right. That was our idea. Um, I want to point out another thing on that same slide. Um, so for the New York project, we did not use, uh, actually, if you want to zoom in, I, I want to just point out there's a diagram on the right that shows how uh, how we conceived this. So this one was not actually designed with using containers, but rather modules that could be lifted into position. And then these modules can be, uh, you know, you can have like a, a uh, the one that has the the bathroom module and then intermediate modules all the way up to the street side. Um, and then the core would have to be built separately uh, also as modules. Uh, but uh, so we kind of, you know, figured out what, what sort of sizes, what trucks can bring into the city and, you know, how they can be delivered and all of that. So this is a different setup. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, 
Uh, so this is what it looks like, very simple, but each unit has a balcony so they, the community can engage with what's going on in the street. You wanna make sure that people can really engage. It's really important. And then we have, you know, all of these houses have, old houses have stoops, but we put a little reinterpreted stoop at the bottom where people within the community can also hang out and again, interact with, with whoever's passing by. So that was kind of important, um, but yeah, very simple. Um, going on and of course we use reclaimed materials and all not you know all the environmental got, uh, yeah two two minutes uh, for now. okay i'm on my <laughs> last slide i think yeah oh, uh, no. one more okay so this one is basically so the same idea they give us 23 sites i've shown about six of them and you can see the dark blue on the the gray areas those are the sites they're super narrow and small lots but we were able to show demonstrate how we could create with like two like varying two widths how we could replicate this solution on 23 sites and uh you know successfully like use this idea of modularity and i, I think my you know if i have to emphasize on anything throughout this presentation that would be the key is like if we can create a, a prototype and test it out it's going to take a little bit of uh, effort and and cost to do that but if we can then replicate it with tweaking you know uh, still providing great design on a variety of sites i think that you know modular and replicability is going to be what we can um, use to sort of solve some of our a crisis, so yeah. like affordable housing, housing home for the houseless. So sorry, I took all my time. No, no, no I'll, I'll just jump in with a couple of comments. You use the word replicability several times. And prior to 1912, automobiles were very, very expensive, only a thing for the rich. Then came along Henry Ford and said, I'm going to build an automobile that my workers can afford. And you have the same print. Oh, and the, the secret there is replicability. You build every car exactly the same way. Your cost goes way, way down. And you are doing replicability in the form of modular housing, where it's all built. The components are built in a factory and you just have cranes and you put them all together. And that really, really brings the cost down and you are afforded a high quality material because it's, these things are built in the, the factory. So, yeah, and, and, and it's all so wonderful looking. I mean, I, I never thought that I would dream of living in a home for, for a very low income people, but this, this looks like a, a little mini uh, dream home that you've created here for Nima. <laughs> well, we, we, you know, architect is important. Where you live is important. It shapes you. And, you know, if you're happy, everybody's happy around you. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you use a wonderful phrase there, the power of design to heal. And that's obviously what you've uh, got in mind here. And I know you're just starting out. This is going to be a new career for you, Pranima, and you are definitely serving humanity and that portion of humanity that most needs to get, in this case, off the streets or out of very miserable housing and into housing that will increase their sense of well being and hopefully their sense of productivity, their health, the whole nine yards. And we all see homeless in the streets, we see low income people, and you are doing your bit to make the world a better place. Pranima, so I, I thank you and appreciate you very much. And on that very cheery note, we must bid fond adieu, think take away cold green, Pranima McCutcheon and Howard Wig. See you next time.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.